Hello everyone, welcome to a Wall Street from Main Street podcast. My name is Mo Dawood, and today's special guest is Dan Collins. He is the founder and editor of the China Money Report. Dan, thank you for coming back again. Thanks, thank you very much. Good to be back. All right, Dan, so, uh, you're, you live mostly in China. I know right now you're in the States uh, visiting uh, family members, but uh, we wanted to bring you on today to discuss mostly about what's going on in China. And so far, a lot of people are concerned about the uh, China economy. Uh, the GDP growth slowed down to 7.5 percent, and um, so far, this is due to credit contraction and the government trying to reduce inflation. So, I wanted to ask you, since you live over there and you, you know, you're part of the Chinese economy and you deal with it every day, do you believe the government is doing more harm than good? Well, I think uh, the Chinese government has kind of done. Is in has is, is done some positive things and some negative things. Um, on the positive side, they had to control inflation. Uh, they had to put controls on with re- with regards to properties. Um, what we've seen the, this year has been a lot slower than normal. China has not continued aggressive easy money policies that that we've con- seen continued in the United States. Uh, China did do the four trillion RMB stimulus back in 2010, but since then they have not um, continued easy quantitative easing because they have seen that most of that money has just been diverted in, into negative areas in the economy, just more property investment and more speculation. So the stock market has not been very good uh, this year, as con- especially compared to the United States. But in China, uh, I'd have to rem- remind people that um, there's not as much financial repression like there is in the United States. In China, you can still today put get a 5.5% return on your fixed deposit in the bank. So most uh, Chinese now are still putting money into property or into bank deposits instead of the markets. Oh, that 5.5% is a lot better than what we have here. That's that's better than a lot of the dividends. Yeah, uh, a lot better than zero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you talk about inflation. You know, the China economy import a lot of the inflation from the U.S. because, you know, they're pegged to the U.S. dollar. Uh, do you believe that anywhere down the road they could unpeg from the U.S. dollar so they can reduce the inflation? Yeah, I believe, uh, well, the renminbi versus the dollar is up about 20, around 25% over the last five years. I think that will continue if you look at the rise of East Asian currencies, the Japanese yen, the Korean won. You know, the Japanese, uh, you know, the Japanese currency increased 400% over 30 years. Uh, I believe that will be similar for the renminbi as long as the uh, root fundamentals of of the Chinese economy continue to get stronger. It still has uh, strong trade surpluses, around almost $300 billion trade surplus with the United States. And that's going to be a trigger for the Chinese currency to continue to get stronger. I think they need it to get stronger. They need to rebalance the economy, let some of the manufacturing uh, go away, leave the country and and uh, let their living standards in China revalue, readjust higher, and focus more into the service economy. And uh, a lot of the inflation that's been imported is due to the Federal Reserve and a quantitative easing program. Uh, you know, you're over there every day. Has the attitude toward the Federal Reserve from China changed in the past few years um, due to the type of monetary policy that's going on in the U.S.? Uh, a lot of people out there, like Peter Schiff, are predicting that eventually China would stop buying treasury bonds. Um, if that haven't happened, they've reduced their uh, treasury bond uh, purchases, but they still are buying a treasury bond. So, uh, so what's your take on that? Well, I think if we look at if we go back to the original uh, credit crisis back in late oh eight oh nine, China had one point one five trillion in U.S. treasuries. Today they have 1.26, so virtually almost no real increase in U.S. Treasuries. Um, you know, despite the U.S. government uh, debt continuing to go up, so where China has not bought, the Federal Reserve has had to come in and take over 80 percent in many many cases, uh, buying 80 percent of the demand for U.S. debt. Uh, so China has uh, not increased Treasury holding, uh, increased their Treasury holding, and I don't expect they, that they will in the future. They will continue to cycle out of U.S. Treasuries uh, and into real commodities. Uh, 
eventually we'll see uh, more pressure on the renminbi to go higher. And in my opinion, what I write about in the China Money Report is that eventually we'll see a Chinese reserve currency replace the dollar as a global reserve currency. So you're predicting that the Chinese currency will become a global world uh, reserve currency down the road? Yeah, I base that basically on the fact that uh, at the end of the day, the world needs Chinese manufactured goods and China needs commodities from places like Brazil, Africa, South America. And America, China is the world's largest creditor nation. It's the world's largest trading nation. They have replaced the United States in both those categories. Everyone's largest trade partner, Brazil, Japan, Germany, is it's all, all their largest trade partners, not, partners are now China, not the United States. And the trade with the United States is really one way. You need to vendor finance, uh, meaning give loans to the United States, just to buy just to buy your goods when you export to the United States. I think that's going to put a big pressure on the U.S. dollar going down. Um, the oil situation is also interesting. The U.S. You know, China is going to be the market for globally imported oil. Saudi Arabia already exports more oil uh, to China than they do the United States. Russia, Angola, Sudan, Iran, they're all selling oil in renminbi now. So we're going to see the end of the petrodollar. We're going to see rise of the petro yuan, and eventually we're going to see uh, when Americans have to pay for all of these consumer goods that they import, the dollar is going to eventually go down when they have nothing else to trade, and the renminbi will quickly uh, fill the vacuum left by the dollar. And that's an interesting point there, and I believe the day that the U.S. dollar uh, stopped becoming the world reserve currency, I think that the uh, U.S. dollar as a whole will be in very big trouble. So we'll see what what happens down the road. So I want to uh, go back and talk about the Chinese economy, and they're mostly an export-driven economy. Uh, a, a lot of the good they, goods and services they produce is being exported to U.S. and Europe and other countries. Um, but now with the economy in uh, stalling right now, do you think China needs to become a consumer-driven economy in order to grow again? Well, I think we, we need to refocus uh, our ideas on, on what type of economy China really is. In America, we, we, because everything on our shelves are made in China, and we yeah. run a $295 billion de deficit with them, we assume that they're an export-only economy. China actually imported last year $1.8 trillion worth of goods and services. That is only slightly less than the $2.2 trillion the United States imported. So China's really a, a major import powerhouse as well as an export powerhouse. Countries like Germany actually run trade surpluses with China, set of deficits. And then you have um, – um, so um, you, China is also number one uh, in, in online retail this year, passing the United States. Um, you know, there's many types of uh, – you know, lug, number one in luxury consumption – so uh, they are, they're still unbalanced. They still are exporting more than they should. They have to rebalance that, and they know that. They're working towards that. But they're not just only export. The economy is uh, quickly rebalancing into a, you know, more of a balanced model approach. And I think a lot of the younger population in the China economy are starting to consume more and more uh, I've seen a lot of articles out there saying that, uh, you know, they have cell phones, uh, they're rolling out cars, even though they're small cars, they're not the car that we have here. But now, China, uh, the China economy now have a bitter, bigger presence in the automobile uh, industry. So we're starting to see a little bit of a uh, consumer economy there in China. Yeah, I mean, talking about cars, um, you know, General Motors sells more cars in China than they do the United States. Um, the China last year produced and sold 20 million cars. Uh, the United States produced about 9 million cars. So China is almost is double in terms of production uh, for the vehicle market. And, yeah, it's kind of ironic how people in China are buying GM cars, but yet most people here in the United States don't buy GM cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, well, they, uh, GM became number one in, in China, and uh, uh, I think they're improving in the U.S., but, yeah, they they're, they're don't have the leader – uh, I think they're still number one in the U.S. maybe in terms of volumes. But, uh, yeah, they're doing very well in China. Okay, great. So the next topic I want to talk about is the China real estate market. A lot of 
uh, mainstream media such as uh, CNBC and Bloomberg uh, talk a lot about the China real estate market. Um, some of them seem to blow it out of proportion that the China real estate market is in a bubble, which we've been hearing for the past four years that the real estate is in a bubble, yet we haven't seen any type of major collapse like we had in this country, even though we, we see some uh, ghost towns, so-called, in the China suburban areas, which we'll discuss later. Do you believe uh, the media is blowing this out of proportion, or is this a big problem in China? Oh, yeah, the, I, I'm glad you bring up that uh, sub-issue is that it's been four years or more now that, that you know China is going to collapse. The Chinese property bubble is collapsing. I've been one of the few people out there that have said that there is no property bubble. Um, you know, in the United States, we had a credit b property bubble, meaning people got access to homes with zero money down, homes they couldn't afford. In China, half of the homes have been purchased cash up front. The other half have, have at least 30% down payment. There's massive amount of equity in China in, in homes. Uh, and despite massive efforts for the Chinese government to stop people from buying properties with cash, the ho home prices have never gone down. Uh, pro property sales this year are up 38%. Home prices are up 15 to 20% depending on the city. Uh, home prices are up now up 14 straight months. So the best the government could do was to slow the market down. Um, and, you know, it's really uh, – um, they put it – you know, in most bubble situations – you know, you're not looking at cases where the government has to actually put in regulations to stop people from buying property with cash. So um, there are issues of ghost cities. That's misallocation you know, of resource by the government in so-called new areas of certain cities. They're not completely new cities, but they're called so-called ghost cities. Government will set up an area and then develop it, and developers will come in and build it. And then it takes several years to fill it up, or in some cases they're not getting filled up at all because they're they're putting a bad area. So uh, in general, yeah, way overblown. There is no credit bubble. You could say there's a pricing bubble, maybe that the property is a, is a little bit too expensive. But and um, uh, but yeah, it's all it back. It goes back to location. Is it with with real estate? I think in your major cities, you you're not going to see any decline in real estate prices. But you out, you may see some declines out in the uh, newer areas in uh, some of the suburban areas. And I think one of the key differences between the China real estate market and the U.S. real estate market is that in here uh, the bank gives out NIDGEL loans, which to you know no income, no assets, uh, no jobs, uh, and, and yet they able to purchase a house while. Well, Near, during the housing bubble, that's what happened. But uh, also the subprime mortgages in China, they don't have that. People save their money, they put down payment, they pay cash, and, and then they get the traditional mortgages through the bank. So uh, yeah. I think that, that's one of the things that people are missing out, that uh, because they see a lot of the ghost town, they, they assume that there's a bubble. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the ghost towns are also, they have overblown the fact they will, Chinese can build, are so efficient in the construction industry, uh, anyone who's done business here will tell you you can build a brand new factory in six months. I mean, there's areas of new city, new new er, areas and new cities. There's China still undergoing a rapid urbanization. I mean, a lot of people are moving in from smaller areas and out from the countryside. They'll build a new area within six, you know, in six eight months. There's ten new apartment blocks, a hospital, a new school, and just put up the whole thing in six months. Well, and then it sits empty. People get pictures of it. Well, it's a ghost town. But it's not been uh, – it's all been bought. It's all been bought and sold. And then if you go back two years later, there's there, there's people moved in. So um, it's overblown. There's definitely misallocation of resources by government over planning like, like you know, like you'd expect in a kind of government planning system. But it's not the government building all this stuff. They are just uh, saying what areas they want to develop, and the developers come and bid, bid on it and build it. Also, the real estate market there is mostly uh, privatized. It's just that the government are telling them where they can build or not build. Exactly. Yep. Okay, great. And uh, I, I saw an article the other day that how China built a replica city of Paris somewhere in China. I forgot the name of the of the town. And it had an exact replica of an Eiffel Tower there. Some of the building and structure look exactly like Paris. I don't know if you know anything about that one. I don't know that one in particular. I do know that China will they'll often do that. They've copied entire little villages from Austria or there's English towns, there's Dutch towns. 
basically a real estate developer will develop a whole new little area of a city with, you know, just like with schools and everything and make it look uh, like a European city. So it doesn't surprise me. I haven't seen that, that city in particular yet. Yeah, and I tip that I tip my hat to them on their creativity on uh, the real estate market there. So shifting gears here and talking about uh, China's sovereign wealth fund, you know they're known for a sector rotation. Uh, they invest in different commodity markets. They've been buying low and selling high for many decades. Uh, the past few years they've been buying copper when it's low. Uh, right now they're buying gold and silver right now because since the price has collapsed. Uh, what commodity do you think China is making large investment into right now? Yeah, I think probably with this, the the Chinese sovereign wealth fund, you know, it's one of the largest pools of money on the planet now. Uh, they're definitely focused with uh, strategic areas for China, which is which in many cases around the metals. Um, I think they're probably staying with, uh, with what we what you had just mentioned, a lot of copper, gold, silver. Uh, next year, 2014, China will do a uh, re- will release their gold reserve number. So they do that every five years. I'm expecting a shock surprise next year with how much gold China's accumulated. Um, they, you know, as everyone knows, they imported 835 tons last year, which would mean they imported just about everything that was produced by the top 10 gold production countries. And then they also produced themselves 420 uh, tons. So, um, yeah, they're going to fo- continue focus on gold and uh, put money where where they can get real value. I think a lot of money is going now into companies to buy up uh, companies globally uh, with merger and acquisition type stuff. And um, so we're starting to see a lot of that now in uh, Europe, United States, Australia, and Canada. I've seen a lot of articles out there saying that uh, China is on – pace to import 100% of their annual mining supply for gold. I, I don't know if you uh, see those numbers or uh, so what's your take on that? Yeah, I have uh, I have the numbers. Um, you know, last year China had around 3,200 tons in reserves. They they produced 420 again and then they imported 835. So they imported a massive amount of gold last year and uh the numbers are at at that pace or higher for this year. So China's basically taken up any gold that's out there. Yeah, they have definitely, and I've seen a lot of pictures of long lines at the jewelry shop and at uh, pawn shop to buy gold and silver. Um, so let's talk about the gold and silver market in relation to China. A lot of experts out there believe that the China econ- uh, economic uh, growth has been slowing down, and that's the reason why gold and silver have not gone up a lot lately. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um, it, it's hard to say. I think there maybe have been some uh, tampering of uh, temp, you know tempering of demand in China somewhat, but in re- in reality, uh, the problem is these markets are not are all traded on Western exchanges and the paper markets. I'm sure you've covered many times is that you know like if you look at the silver market. An entire year's mining supply of silver could be traded on the COMEX with guys that actually don't own any silver. So the prices, you know, are often very, often very not transparent uh, for the paper markets. It's really where the physical markets and the paper markets have devar- devar- divulged, and uh, the, the paper market ends up having to catch back up to the physical market. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say maybe some slower demand this year, but not not really. I mean, the Chinese continue. Uh, as an inflation hedge and to put their money into real assets, it's continuing to go into physical metals. And that's really been driven by the top four banks here. They have gold and silver products. You can buy bars. You can keep your bank account in gold. You can trade from gold to Chinese uh, renminbi, you know, online uh, with low, with almost zero transaction fees involved. So uh, I think China, the Chinese government and the Chinese banks are continuing to push the holding of gold for China, I don't see that to change. And yeah, that's a good point. There, there's a big diversion between the paper market and the physical market. A lot of people are buying like crazy in China, India, here in the U.S., in Europe, and other countries as well. Yet the paper market, uh, the prices keep going down. So the paper market does not actually reflect the supply and demand fundamentals for gold and silver right now. Absolutely, I just keep accumulating. <laughs> 
Yep, yep, same here, same here. They're going back to China and, and how they uh, allocate their investment. They have a big presence in the U.S. lately, uh, especially in the real estate market here in the U.S. They've been buying uh, uh, properties in the West Coast and other parts of the country as well and rent them, rent, renting them out. What prompts them to come here in the U.S. to start buying uh, properties when uh, they have a pretty good uh, real estate market in China? Well, the, uh, what's prompting uh, Chinese to buy property in the United States is if you look, look globally, the U.S. has probably some of the lowest property prices in the world for what you can get here compared to anywhere in the world. I mean, uh, you know, what you can get here, uh, you know, for a four- or five-bedroom apartment is like a very small – four- or five-bedroom house in the United States is like a small apartment in China for the price. So that's one issue. The, set, the major issue, though, I think, is that most uh, Chinese real estate – small investors come over is that many of their kids now are going to universities in the United States. So Chinese foreign students now are by far the largest uh, group of foreign students. And many of them will come to buy a house here to get uh, um, lower tuition rates. If you own a home in the state, you obviously get in-state tuition. So a lot of it, a lot of uh, educational needs is driving a lot of uh, uh, home purchases from China into the United States. Now that's, an, <clears throat> that's an interesting point there. And one of the uh, uh, purchases that China made that made headline lately is the purchase of Smithfield Food. Um, do you think China helped finance the purchase of Smithfield Food to provide a more reliable pork supply to Chinese people in order to offset the food price inflation? Yeah, all, uh, all of these uh, major, the big, big mergers and acquisitions, many of it has uh, Chinese government money behind it. So, for instance, when uh, the car maker Geely bought Volvo out of Sweden, you know the whole value of the company of Geely was two hundred million dollar. Yet they paid two billion dollars to buy Volvo, really ten times the whole value of their company. So that money comes from somewhere. It doesn't come from the company. It comes from uh, the banks, provincial banks, and the, some of the larger city banks in the cities that back up these companies to go make the acquisitions, uh, you know, outside China. In terms of why they want a pork producing company, it may be it may be for some technology. It may be uh, you know just to uh, get more stable supply of pork. The prices of pork in China are three two three times what they are in the United States, so um, it probably makes sense from the Chinese standpoint. Just, um, so going back to talking about Smithfield Food, uh, a lot of people are concerned that uh, not the Chinese. Uh, bought out Smithfield Food, that the quality of food is now going to go down because, I don't know, for some reason, people here think China like to cut corners and um, make stuff as cheap as possible uh, when it comes to food. Is any of that uh, validated or uh, reasonable? Well, I think in the short term, probably not. I think the the, the U.S. operations, from the, the, oper- the, com- the types of companies that I see in the United States where Chinese companies have bought them, most of the time, they, you know, they don't know how to run the companies here, which means they leave the management teams fully in place in the United States. So from a real operational perspective, I would doubt anything in the U.S. for Smithfield Food would change. Um, yeah, long term, it's, you know, who knows? Maybe some of the lower level product lines start getting imported from China, and absolutely there's concern. I, w- I don't think I had, with China's f- food safety record, I don't think I would want any food imported from China at all. I agree with you there, but at the U.S., not like we take care of our food here either. We have a lot of uh, questionable practices by U.S. food producers as well. So. Absolutely. So, so Dan Collins, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming on for Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. If people want to find out more about your work, where can they go? They can find me at thechinamoneyreport.com. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you coming on again, and hopefully you can come back on uh, again uh, down the road. Anytime. Glad to be back.